Afternoon. Good morning. If you're on the West Coast, welcome back wherever you are. We are here with the EFF panel, uh, which I am excited to, uh, to see come back to Hope yet again. Uh, Hope, of course, is supporting the EFF with a fundraiser, and we would very much encourage you to visit the Hope website, uh, look at the, uh, the, the information on that. We want you to donate to that fundraiser. We want to hit our goals this year uh, to support the EFF, uh, our nation's premier uh, civil liberties uh, organization for, for digital rights and for the internet. So I'm going to turn it over to Kurt Opsahl from the EFF to introduce our panelists and for them to give us uh, their update for the year. And we're going to be going into a Q&A session a little bit later. So if you're not already signed into Matrix Chat, please do sign in there. Please prep your questions. And we'll be picking from those questions for uh, the conversation for the rest of the two hour session that we have here. Kurt, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's great to be uh, back at Hope. Uh, it's uh, a little strange this year, not, not being with everybody in person. Uh, I certainly miss uh, seeing you all uh, directly, but we're glad to be back uh, and offering uh, Ask the EFF, the year in, in uh, digital civil liberties, uh, as we do. Uh, so uh, for those who you are, are new to this, uh, this is a basically an AMA style conversation with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we will give a short introduction soon. We'll, just, we'll go down the uh, uh, the panelists, uh, my co-panelists, to introduce themselves and to uh, talk a little bit about their work, uh, and then we turn it over to you for your questions. Um, and we hope that the introductions inspire some of your questions, but uh, you can feel free to ask. Uh, any questions that you'd like uh, for the uh, EFF. A um, couple of things to sort of start out as, as ground rules. Uh, one is that, uh, uh, as many of you know, the EFF does uh, uh, provide legal advice. Uh, well, in particular for this community, we have the Coders' Rights Project, uh, where we represent uh, security researchers who have legal questions about their research, about uh, publishing uh, their research. Uh, however, this is not the time to bring your uh, privileged uh, conversations or questions about specific things that you may have done. Uh, you want that to be an attorney-client uh, privilege conversation, which is not something which is shared by the entire world on a live stream. Uh, so, uh, and this also includes, you know, thinly veiled hypotheticals about your friend who has a surprisingly similar situation. Like if you have a real legal question about your own situation, talk to us on a different forum. Uh, but we can talk more generally about legal issues. Uh, and then uh, if, you, if you do need to reach out, uh, info at EFF.org, that's the email address. It goes to our uh, wonderful uh, intake coordination team who will then route it to the appropriate people. Uh, and it goes into our ticketing system and such. So we will try to uh, get back to you uh, quickly. Uh, with any any kind of uh, uh, legal situation that you may have. Uh, so so with that, um, well, I'll start out uh, talking a little bit about some of the things that uh, that I've been working on. Uh, you know, well, one of course is the the coders' rights. Uh, we've been talking to a number of people who are presenting at the various summer security uh, conferences. Uh, that has been exciting so far. So good on that. Um, but uh, not much in, in detail. I can go into the particular situations until their their presentations have concluded, and we found that there's no no troubles. Uh, but another thing that I've been working on is COVID apps. Uh, you know, we currently have a, a pandemic where contact tracing is considered to be in a very important aspect of trying to rein in that pandemic. Uh, contact tracing is the process where you find someone is infected, and you try to figure out who they may have infected themselves before they went into to quarantine. Uh, is used to help stop the spread uh, and get those people either to get tested uh, or to quarantine themselves until they can get tested. Uh, so it can be very helpful. Uh, and a lot of people said, well, why don't we apply technology to that? And well, I totally appreciate uh, that people want to use uh, technology to try to improve the circumstances. Uh, you know, oftentimes, when you bring technology to these things, it raises new uh, uh, additional issues. And this is no different from, uh, from contact tracing and, and COVID uh, apps. So we've been looking about that uh, uh, and have a, a bit of a, 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 you know, a trade-off, I guess, as some people will say it, but I think you can actually do it 
well without making sacrifices to essential liberties. Uh, and the rising uh, like winner in this is the notion of decentralized contact tracing, which is more proximity tracing, trying to uh, get the uh, uh, records of when you've been in proximity with somebody else as opposed to location. And I think a lot of the bad ideas that came out in contact tracing were focused on trying to keep permanent records of where everybody was at all times to enable contact tracing later. And that's a lot more information than you need to accomplish the job. And it has a tremendous effect on civil liberties if there's a permanent record of where you've been. Uh, but nevertheless, your right to association is also an important aspect of civil liberty. So a permanent record of who whomever you've met is also sensitive. Uh, and so the better way forward on that is to have user control. Uh, the information stays on, on, the, uh, on the device uh, until it is needed, uh, trying to anonymize the information when it is provided. Uh, and it is notifying people that they may have been contact and they can take the next step of going into to getting sent. So a lighter touch but uh, one more protective of, of civil liberties. But that is not more. That is not all. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that it doesn't do any uh, harm to the freedom? Well, uh, a very important one, a starting point, is informed voluntary and opt-in consent. It's a fundamental requirement, uh, and this includes informal pressure. Uh, for example, saying that uh, you can't enter into this space unless you have this app uh, working. Things like that are a way to manufacture uh, consent. Um, we have the ability to turn it off. Uh, there may be times when it is uh, you're you know, engaged in something sensitive, like political organizing, or maybe you're a healthcare worker and you're going into uh, a situation where you're going to have high contact with COVID people, and you don't want to create a whole bunch of uh, uh, unnecessary contacts because uh, you know what that situation is, and you're taking appropriate uh, precautions. Mm -hmm. Another key principle: minimization proximity tracking for contact tracing to collect the least possible information. Uh, so this is, you know, maybe just that you were in proximity, maybe the vagueness of, the, uh, you know, uh, a vague piece of information about the time. You don't need to know the precise time. You don't need to know the precise location. You just need to know approximately when, uh, so we can say where, where the uh, quarantine time begins. Uh, another thing we're probably very important to this community, information security. Uh, this is, these are going to be apps that are going to be running constantly on people's phones. They're going to have access to at least Bluetooth, um, and maybe some other functions on the phone. Uh, and we unfortunately have seen that, uh, apps that are rushed into, uh, into production due, due to a crisis sometimes skip over the information security step. Uh, and this will be a tempting target if it is actually an app gets popularized and is used by millions and millions of people. Uh, constantly. So these, these apps need to be robustly tested by independent uh, researchers. Also some transparency, put out the code, allow people to look at that, not only testing the app, but looking for bugs within the, in the code and make sure as best we can that we've identified as many bugs as possible before it goes into popular use. Um, and uh, we're going to make sure that the apps uh, are addressing some of the biases that will come from uh, use of these apps. Uh, the apps will be, uh, well, it can be used in, in two ways of, of bias. One is that uh, the bias inherent in who has access to smartphone technologies uh, and would be able to use the app. That is not 100% of the, of the population. Um, and if, if you make things dependent on having a smartphone app, you're leaving some people out of that picture. Uh, it also may uh, affect the uh, uh, resources that are being provided by uh, the government. Uh, so if they are looking at the app as a source of what the, what the truth is and where resources are needed, that means that these communities will be less likely to get the, uh, the materials because they didn't have the smartphones in the, in the first place. Um, and I think uh, uh, sort of finally, and a very important uh, uh, limitation, they got to have an expiration date. It has to end. Uh, you know, it has been, uh, there's been an unfortunate history of uh, 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 things done in an emergency uh, uh, situation that continue after the emergency is ended. And so any of these apps uh, need to have an expiration date. 
along with the ability of I'm going to independently turn it off and get out. Anyway, that's just uh, some of our thoughts on COVID apps. But let me uh, turn it over to our uh, our next panelist, Alexis. Introduce yourself. And thank you. Hi, I'm Alexis Hancock. I am a staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I primarily work on HTTPS Everywhere web extension that's available on Chrome and Firefox and Package Engine Tour and also used within Brave. And I primarily work on that piece where building tools within tech projects. And I also focus on researching things around the realm of like mobile phones and consumer privacy. And with what Kurt said around COVID, I've been working on COVID immunity passport research and digital identities. So a lot of it had entailed where he, as he said, where there's been some techno solutions around enforcing what it could look like when we re-enter society without proven science or knowledge, whether or not what immunity looks like. So uh, I've been seeing a lot of problematic apps out there and proposals around COVID immunity passports in particular. And that really concerns me around tech equity and researching the standards that are being put in place to enforce these things. The fact that immunity passports aren't really standardized documentation. It's not just simply test results. It's an actual formal document that could have a dynamic status and a permanent status depending on what type of technology gets used and when and in what context, especially with law enforcement or your employer or a venue you're trying to enter or simply a space you're trying to enter in the public space. So those really worry me in particular when it comes to COVID and I've been focused on that piece, especially with a bill that's been in California that mentioned COVID immunity passports, not in that particular language, but it's pretty much hinting at that. And we're scared that would give a segue to formalize digital documentation as the first standard. And that could possibly lead to conversations around nationalized IDs in the US and a database where it's more centralized and more subject to breach. Other than that, um, I do a lot of research in other realms where I try to focus on tech equity in particular and usually around usage of mobile phones and discussing with different communities and my activism around how to keep themselves safe with their tech. And with that, I work on a security education companion at EFF at sec.eff.org to help security trainers and people out there stay safe and train other people to stay safe online. And I'll pass it to the next panelist. Lovely, hey. me, yeah. Um, so hi, my name is India McKinney and I am the Director of Federal Affairs at EFF, which is a fancy way of saying that I am a lobbyist. Um, so the first time I ever went to one of these conferences and I learned a little bit about social engineering, I felt very uncomfortable because the principles of persuasion that social engineers use to talk people out of their passwords and their social security numbers are the same principles that I use to convince lawmakers that they should listen to us. Um, and sometimes it really helps when current events uh, sort of overtake some of the things that we've been working on. So for example, one of the things that I've been working on for a number of years with EFF is our facial recognition advocacy uh, and all of the civil liberties um, risks that come with facial recognition technology when it's deployed and who has access to it and should be should your face be able to be used for your identification and all the ways the TSA wants to use it and we think that's terrible and so what's really interesting with some of the news events that have happened in the world is lawmakers are really attuned to what's happening back home in their districts and so then all of a sudden people started calling us back because we had already established this incredible body of record and or body of work. And so we had just kept putting it on their desks. And so when they finally had some questions and they wanted to actually introduce legislation related to a ban on facial recognition, they called us to make sure that their legislation was actually going to do the things that they wanted it to do. So that was a really great thing to do. So I used to work on Capitol Hill. So I actually understand the legislative process from the inside. And I use some of that knowledge to help EFF figure out how to target our resources on bills that are actually a threat as opposed to the thousands of other federal bills that never move. Um, every two year cycle, 
there's about 5,000 pieces of legislation that are introduced. Um, most of them are never going to go anywhere. You're never going to know about them. You're never going to hear about them. They don't matter. So what's the difference between those bills and the bills like the Earn It Act that are a very real threat in the world? Uh, so for those that don't know, the Earn It Act is a bill from Senators Blumenthal and Graham that would massively change the way Section 230 works for internet platforms with a little side bonus of allowing the DOJ to actually force companies to break encryption. Um, EFF recognized very, very early on what exactly the threat to that, that this bill was, what the legislation actually said, because um, they were very sneaky about how they did it. Uh, and so we have been very active in opposing this bill very early on, and I'm very proud of the way our advocacy around this has unfolded. And in fact, in a large part because of our activism and our lobbying and our successful grassroots efforts, the bill sponsors actually radically changed the structure of the bill. So it's now it's a little more complicated and it's a little more sneaky, still very bad. Um, and we can get into all those details later if you want. Um, but a lot of the ways that the bill process unfolded had a lot to do with the way that we were successfully talking to the world and talking to other lawmakers and really convincing people that it's a really terrible idea to let the DOJ control whether or not you're allowed to have end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, um, which it is, full stop. Um, so really looking forward to taking your questions. My job is super awesome and I really love talking about the legislative process. So really interested to hear whatever questions you have for us on that and I will pass to the next person. Hello, yeah. I think the next person is me. Uh, my name is Naomi Gillins. I'm a legal fellow at EFF where I litigate free speech and civil liberties issues that intersect with technology. So first of all, thank you so much to Hope for having us back here. It is awesome to be here chatting with you guys. Uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what is on my docket right now. So first of all, um, protests happening across the country right now, of course. Um, so at EFF, we've been keeping an eye on uh, how law enforcement is policing those protests. And because we are EFF, we're focusing especially on police abuses of technology from police tracking people at protests, compiling intelligence reports on journalists covering protests, um, monitoring people's social media feeds, all sorts of things like that. Um, I've also been tracking the ways that the spread of COVID-19 has affected speech rights around the globe. So a major trend that we are seeing right now is countries using the pandemic as an excuse to enact laws that prohibit the spread of false information online. Okay, so that like might sound like kind of a good thing on first listen, but this is a huge problem because what this does is this gives the party that's in control of law enforcement the power to decide what is true, what is false, and then enforce that, right, with the full power of the criminal law. So what we're seeing across the globe is that governments in power are using these kinds of laws as a pretext to detain, uh, interrogate, prosecute people who share information that doesn't align with the official state narrative, right? And that includes journalists, it includes whistleblowers, political dissidents, um, members of opposition parties, and just anyone, any citizen, right, of the country who's sharing information online about what they're observing or their own experiences. Um, and that chills people from talking about what's happening in their countries or investigating official actions or challenging the official narrative, right? At a time when independent reporting and investigation is should absolutely be fostered and encouraged and not suppressed in any way. Um, final thing I'll talk about right now that might be of particular interest to all the hackers out there in the audience. Um, I've been working on issues surrounding the right to do computer security research in this country. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or the CFAA. And what this is, is it's the federal anti-hacking law, right? This law is notoriously ambiguous. Courts have been trying to figure out exactly what it means since it was enacted in the 1980s. And different courts in the country have interpreted this law in different ways. And this has led to this patchwork effect where certain types of security research might be a crime in some parts of the country, uh, but in other parts of the country, maybe it's fine. So 
a lot of confusion around this and uh, counseling people about this is a lot of what we do at the coders rights project that Kurt was talking about. Um, definitely encourage all of you as he did to reach out to us uh, if we can help you wade through this, but hopefully this year we'll get at least a little bit of clarity, um, at least about part of it because the Supreme Court is hearing a case called Van Buren versus the United States. And this gives the court finally the chance to weigh in on whether violating use restrictions is a crime under the CFAA. So EFF submitted a brief in that case on behalf of computer security researchers. Uh, the nine justices on the Supreme Court uh, may be very concerned about malicious computer break-ins and uh, we are concerned that they don't fully realize the importance of public interest, independent computer security research. So what we did in our brief is we explained, you know, first of all, independent security research is critically important, right? To the overall security of this nation uh, from shoring up election systems and software to making sure that our critical infrastructure systems are secure to, you know, securing medical devices or uh, automo uh, automobile software. Um, so we explain the importance of this kind of research and how it's contributed to security in the past. And then second of all, we explain that even though this kind of independent research is obviously in the public interest, searching for vulnerabilities that bad actors could exploit might require computer security researchers to violate terms of use, right? Um, companies have terms that prohibit things, the, all kinds of things from uh, reverse engineering, scraping, you know, what have you that a researcher might need to do. Um, but the government's really broad interpretation of the CFAA would make that kind of research um, a crime if it violates terms. Um, and that's a serious disincentive that prevents some independent researchers from doing this really important work, right? And work that's to everyone's benefit. Um, I'm gonna stop there for now. I am happy to take questions about this. I love talking about this. Um, and we're expecting a Supreme Court decision about it uh, sometime in this next year, which is very exciting. So stay tuned for that. But uh, for now, I'll pass it along to Rory. Hey, thanks. And thank you again, Hope, for having us. Um, I'm Rory. I'm the most recent addition to the EFF activism team. I started in March, so it's been an interesting time to join the organization, to say the least. Um, I'm the grassroots advocacy organizer, uh, which is part of the organizing team, uh, which manages the Electronic Frontier Alliance. Um, so the Electronic Frontier Alliance, um, hopefully you've heard of, is a network of local organizations uh, working on important local issues that uh, aren't always taken up by national organizations like the EFF. Um, unfortunately, the EFF can't be everywhere at once. Uh, so it really falls on these local organizations to advocate um, for their city, for their state, um, to um, make sure that our digital rights are defended and to make sure that their neighbors and people in their community are also empowered to take action and are well informed about how to stay safe and how these technologies work. Um, so the EFA started, um, the EFF started the EFA, I should say, um, to support these organizations and give them a system of support. Um, and I'm happy to say we now have more than 70 grassroots organizations in our network um, across the entire US and it's continuing to grow. Um, so prior to the EFF, I was actually a member of one of these EFA organizations, the Cypher Collective in New York City. Um, so I'm lucky enough that I'm now on the managing side of it, uh, but I was a member of one of the groups earlier. So I get to see the whole picture of uh, what it has to offer. Um, so groups in the network um, do remain completely autonomous. Um, and it's really important to us to keep it distributed instead of overly centralized because we don't wanna be the bottleneck preventing people from organizing. We wanna make sure that they are empowered to um, work together, um, share resources and um, all while we still offer whatever support we can and plenty of opportunities to join our campaigns uh, when it's aligned with their local issues. Um, and I think it's a really cool aspect of the Alliance is uh, these community organizations, um, while the EFF might be experts in digital rights, these community organizations uh, tend to also be experts in their own community. Um, an example might be a student group. There's many student groups in the EFA uh, and they know 
plenty about student rights and issues particular to their campus. Uh, so we can help lift up the digital rights component of that uh, for things like the upcoming semester, a lot of concerns with the pandemic, uh, concerns with contact tracing apps being required or proctoring software being required. We can help them on the digital rights front and they bring their own expertise uh, to the issue as well. Um, so members of EFA are just asked to have accessible events and to endorse the EFA's five core principles, which are uh, supporting free expression, security, privacy, creativity, and access to knowledge. Um, and as long as they endorse those principles, uh, we're happy to work with folks. Um, it's okay if they don't have full alignment with EFF's stance on issues, uh, as long as we're all working towards the same end. We want a really broad uh, coalition, a really broad network. Um, and broadly speaking, these groups fall into three buckets. Um, one, community education advocates, and that's like the Cypher Collective I was a part of, um, or Crypto Party Ann Arbor in Michigan uh, that are working to, usually with libraries um, or universities to help people learn um, how to stay safe, having crypto parties. Um, there's also hacker spaces and maker spaces like Crash Space in LA or DEF CON 201 in New Jersey. Um, and then our advocacy groups, uh, such as uh, Surveillance Technology Oversight Project in NYC uh, or PDX Privacy in Portland. Um, and it's really interesting to bring all these different kind of strategies and all these different type of community engagement together, especially when people uh, cross um, across those different categories. Um, so some recent big wins I wanna throw out there is especially for the educators and makerspaces, um, it's been really hard um, to pivot to be online. Uh, that sort of community work kind of necessarily involves hanging out with people in your community and talking with them face to face. Um, so it's been a difficult transition, but I'm really happy to say um, our groups have been incredibly resilient and have been sharing resources on how to have streaming events um, and maybe even conferences. For example, your privacy lab is a member that had the Flatten the Curve Summit in July. Um, and then just a shout out DEF CON 201 and Ethics and Tech again for being uh, super involved in streaming events. Um, and of course, at events like this one at Hope, we have Cyper Collective and DEF CON 201 um, submitting talks and engaging with the community in that way. Um, and then of course, advocacy. Uh, we've had some really great wins and great efforts. Um, I'll shout out Surveillance Tech and Oversight Project in New York, passing the POST Act or the Police Oversight and Surveillance Technology. Act um, in New York City, uh, an amazing win, um, totally in awe of their efforts. Um, so now the NYPD must uh, set policies on surveillance and actually follow those policies. Um, and then there's groups like PDX Privacy, which have been doing great work on uh, banning face recognition in their city um, and passing uh, things like CCOPS or the Community Control Over Police Surveillance um, and Militization. Uh, so we have these groups across the country doing these amazing local things. Um, I want to just quickly plug, if you are part of a group, and I think there's a lot of folks that are, feel free to email me, uh, Rory at EFF.org, or organizing at EFF.org, or if you want to learn more, there's EFF.org slash fight. Um, yeah, happy to work with y'all. All right, well, thank you, Rory. So... Kurt, do you want to take some questions now? Yes, absolutely. We've had some, some good questions come in. Uh, and so thanks for keeping those questions coming. Uh, so one of the questions, uh, do you want to read it off? I'll take the last question. Yeah, so, so we have a few questions already in the chat. Um, I just want to remind people if they're not logged into Matrix, please log into Matrix chat, throw your questions in the session Q&A channel, and we will get them teed up for here. Um, so one of the things that's come up a couple of times with the the comments in the Q&A uh, is summed up, I think, by this question. Uh, what more can we do besides encouraging others to visit sites like the EFF to inform and educate others from attorneys to activists to average technology users to learn about their civil rights and liberties and violations of such and to advocate for themselves? So I can take yeah. that. 
Yeah. Um, that's a really, really great question. And it's sort of the fundamental basis for all of the work that we do. So the first thing is like, there's a lot of stuff out there that's really scary. And especially once you start looking under the hood of what is technologically possible with a lot of things, there's a lot that can really freak you out. The thing is though, that doesn't mean you should just give up. There are a t there have always been a lot of threats that have always existed in the real world as well as the, now the digital world. But when we leave our home every day, we lock our front door. When you go somewhere in your car, you get out of your car and you lock the door. That doesn't mean that somebody can't break into your house. That doesn't mean that somebody can't break into your car, but you still lock your door. You still lock your house. So the thing to focus on is the specific actions that an individual can do both to make themselves safer as a person and also to help create a system that creates more safety and more transparency and more openness to protect us all as a structure. So, you know, something's really easy, like you want a password manager. You want to make sure that each one of your passwords for all of your sites is unique and long and complicated. Um, a lot of us at EFF use one password. We do not endorse any products whatsoever. I'm just telling you what we happen to use. Um, you want to make sure that your passwords are unique and different. Um, you want to make sure that your um, you're using two-factor authentication on anything that has to do with your personal information. You're not giving your personal information to people who don't need it, um, especially in the pandemic. I'm really annoying for a lot of people, like legit services that I want to buy where they want me to give them their credit card, my credit card number over the phone, and I just don't do that as a practice. Um, there's just a couple of things that you can do that are not that difficult. You know, if you want to start getting more into OPSEC, you can start looking into other things like Tor and other stuff to protect some of your browsing history, but you don't have to start there. Start with the password manager. And then for other things, I mean, going to the EFF website, signing up for the action alerts, working with the grassroots groups, like you definitely want to be talking to your elected representatives. Technology is becoming a much, much bigger part of our global structure or country structure, and they need to hear from their constituents. One of the things that I run into a lot on Capitol Hill is that a lot of Capitol Hill staffers don't fully understand technology in the way that y'all will, and that's okay. They understand the legislative process, but they need to hear from people who do understand the technology and they need to understand what the limits of the technology are. So a lot of lawmakers and a lot of people who don't know technology all that well sort of think technology is magic. And so if it's all magic to start with, why can't you sprinkle the fairy dust and make it do exactly the thing that you want to do? So, you know, encryption is a great example. You can totally have end-to-end -end encryption where it's totally safe from all of the hackers and the bad people and the whatever, but the DOJ has this secret key that only they have that they will never ever misuse, that they they can go in and get the messages from the bad people. Magic super fairy dust. That sounds like a great thing in theory. It just, the math doesn't work. But you have, if you don't know that it's based on math, if you don't understand how it actually works, then there's like, if it's all magic, why can't you have the magic do the thing that you want it to do? So you want to make sure that your voice is being heard. Decisions are made from those people who show up. So you want to make sure that you show up. Go to town hall meetings, ask questions, talk to your elected officials. A lot of stuff is happening at the civic, local civic level, city councils, school boards, all that stuff. Make sure that it can be really boring, but make sure that you just show up and say, hello, this is who I am. I live in your district and this is what I think. And that does a lot more than you think it does. I don't know if anybody has, Alexis, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Um in my security training experience, the one thing I just tell people, especially technologists, because I feel like we fall into this category a lot when we explain things to people, there's a difference between informing people and telling people what you know. So a lot of us are very excited to talk about things we know and try to share that information. But if you're not coming down to the level where you're informing someone on what they can and can't do, what the limitations are and what tools they can use and translating it to how what their needs are in their context, then the information can often get lost and overwhelming. So I just wanted to add that piece. Thank you both. So our next question, how do you think the relationship between masks and facial recognition will evolve? Who wants to go? Okay. With that? 
uh, I can take that question. So I, I've actually been looking uh, at, at uh, masks and facial recognition. The uh, uh, NIST, the National Institute for Science and Technology, just published a study on masks and, and facial recognition. Um, they're actually they're working to try to make it so that uh, facial recognition can get past uh, masks. They're working with the DHS and the Customs and Border Patrol. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a very interesting study because uh, it revealed uh, in, in, in great detail uh, how well algorithms were working with, with masks. And uh, uh, masks, unsurprisingly, do help protect you against facial recognition. Uh, but uh, there, there are a lot of differences out there. So uh, a couple of handy tips that, that came out of looking at that research is that uh, uh, you want to have a mask uh, that goes all the way up to the uh, top of your nose, the where your eyes are. Uh, the more of the nose you cover, the more difference it makes, up to 36 times uh, more protective than the median algorithm for a, a full coverage. Uh, and then also full coverage on the sides. Uh, that also helps. That's about two times better than the round masks, the, the sort of more, more uh, typical N95 uh, construction uh, uh, dust masks style, uh, and then black was uh, uh, better at protecting against uh, uh, facial recognition. Uh, black uh, led to a lot of no face, where they were the the algorithm wasn't able to detect a face in the first place to uh, to uh, measure against uh, or to compare against. Uh, however, this is seen by the government as a problem that, that uh, masks are making facial recognition more difficult. Facial recognition is something that they really wanted to do. DHS, uh, in the last uh, uh, the report came out last year that they were doing something in the order of 45 million uh, facial recognition scans each year. They, they're frustrated that uh, masks are getting in the way. Uh, and so uh, the, the next NIST study is going to be looking at new mask-enabled algorithms that are going to try to be able to identify people despite wearing uh, a mask. Uh, so I'm, I'm very curious to see how that will go and whether the lessons one can draw where uh, masks will help protect you from existing facial recognition uh, algorithms will also continue to protect you otherwise. Um, and the other uh, uh, interesting aspect of, of the research was uh, I was talking about you know various things that would increase the error rate, but uh, it was increasing the error rate in the no match uh, direction, which if you're trying to protect your privacy is the direction you want, uh, and was not uh, increasing the error rate very significantly in the false match, which is to say it gives a false answer of saying that you are somebody else which is good because one of the dangerous things that, that happens with facial recognition is that it recognizes you with somebody else's picture and then all of a sudden they think that you've done the crime and uh, you know you get caught up uh, in some things that we've had people who have been uh, arrested because their face matched somebody else's photo uh, and then they just went and arrested them. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of these algorithms uh, show uh, racial bias, where they are less effective uh, and have more of these false matches uh, for uh, uh, minority communities. And this you know, has a terrible effect on, on uh, civil liberties where we have a false accusation based on a flawed algorithm. Uh, the other thing you say, you know, uh, uh, so science in, of this, they're going to try to make it so the algorithms can figure out who you are, uh, even despite having a, a, a mask on. Uh, but there's also the the politics, which is trying to get it so that uh, uh, there are laws uh, usually effective so far at the local level uh, that are prohibiting police use of uh, facial recognition. Uh, and I think actually, Rory, some of that's been with EFA groups. You want to say a few things on that? Yeah, the local EFA efforts have really been great um, with recent success in Boston and looks like in uh, Portland. Uh, so um, yeah, it's part of our uh, About Face campaign. If you go to eff.org slash About Face, um, there's a lot of materials there, um, sample language you can use for uh, advocating for these uh, face recognition bands locally. Um, and yeah, meeting up with local EFA groups to work on that. <laughs> 
All right, super. So talking of facial recognition, our next question is uh, focused on New York. Uh, and what do you think of the Link NYC kiosks around NYC that have three cameras in each of them? Yeah, um, I'll quickly speak on Link NYC and then I'll pass it to Rory to add to that. Um, so what I think about them is that the initial rollout was inherently flawed in a lot of ways uh, of Link NYC. It was an initiative that allegedly was bringing Wi-Fi to the general public in New York City and asked someone for from, from there and lived there for quite some time. It was very troubling to see the rollout of such. So there was no real secure way of like handling the Wi-Fi and there's a discussion around VPNs and such, but the cameras in particular, uh, we're worried because, well, I'm worried in particular because of the relationship with NYPD and the way they could use that footage and that data since it's a public service that is handled by the city, it's in partnership with Google. So there's a corporate surveillance aspect to that. So those are my initial worries and concerns, especially since they rolled it out in all five boroughs, I believe. I'm not sure it's in Staten Island. I don't really include them half the time, but they're a borough, right? Um, so I've seen a massive rollout of this of these kiosks everywhere and you see them normally by like train stations. So I figure the, the footage and the extra surveillance is usually around trans transit centers in particular and seeing people from walk in certain patterns from day to day. So you can link a lot of data in that way, right? So that's my initial thought on those and I'll pass it to Rory. Yeah, definitely. I also recently lived in New York and Link NYC definitely felt like a Trojan horse of sorts of uh, we're providing community Wi-Fi and like modernizing the city. And then um, there's all these questions of uh, surveillance and um, privacy violations. Um, and I want to really plug and defer to Rethink Link NYC, another EFA member um, who are calling uh, for a few demands to uh, Link NYC. Uh, halt the construction, uh, remove surveillance cameras and Bluetooth beacons, uh, answer public questions, because there's just a lot of unknowns about uh, how these kiosks are working, um, and provide genuine community Wi-Fi that kind of make good on the initial promise um, and institute some sort of oversight to make sure that network's not being abused. Um, so definitely check out Rethink Link NYC for more depth and policy on that. Okay, thank you. So changing from one coast to another, but staying on the streets, we have a questioner who was learning during the course of protesting in Seattle about the way that activists are doing their research on cops via PACER. What is the state of liberating PACER? How much progress have we made? Yeah, I can speak to that. So PACER, for those who might not know is this um, government run system that's you know a document retention system that collects all of the papers that are filed in federal courts. This is what lawyers use and judges uh, to look through the dockets of federal cases and see what's been filed um, and the general public also. And all of these materials are um, publicly available, right? There's a, there's a first amendment right to access documents that are publicly filed in courts. Um, but because they're collected online in this database, um, the problem is that this database is fee-based. So, you know, even if you could like physically walk up to a courthouse and ask to inspect documents, which of course right now you probably can't. Um, and in general, maybe you can't because there are these courthouses all over the country. So your option is to find them online and then you're going to be charged for them. And the charges are often pretty exorbitant and add up quite quickly. So this is a huge problem um, because it limits public access to these public documents. But the good news is that there is a great project that is set up to address this and it's called Recap, um, which is PACER backwards. Uh, it is an online archive and I, there's a Chrome extension, I believe, and I think there's a Firefox add-on. And the way that it works is that you can download this extension um, and then when you go to PACER um, to see a document and pay a fee for it, 
it will automatically upload a copy of that document to the recap archive where it will then be available for free to anybody on recap. So if you just download recap, you can go to their archive, um, you know, find it online and see what's available online. And it's not everything, but a lot of documents saved in PACER are available there. And I would really recommend, first of all, definitely look for documents there before going to PACER. And then if you do go to PACER, um, please download this extension because it is a benefit to everyone uh, and a huge boon to public transparency in the courts. Super. So we had a shout out from uh, you guys to DEF CON 201 earlier, and they, they said, thank you very much for that. And Side Pocket sent in this question. What is your opinion about President Annoying Orange wanting to ban TikTok? We at DEF CON 201 feel that while TikTok is a nightmare and we have a TikTok to inform people on TikTok about its issues, it seems obvious that TikTok is being banned not because of privacy invasion, but that the privacy invasion is for China and not for the US, pound sign, delete Facebook. All right, yeah, I, I can take that that question. I've been looking a, a, a bit about the the TikTok uh, situation. And let me just sort of say as a, as a starting point, uh, is that uh, when, when President Trump will has a, has a technique he often uses, which is to say something like, I will ban TikTok without explaining what that means, what law might be invoked to do this, what authority, or listen, I have the authority, and what does that exactly mean? Uh, so we have seen, for example, from uh, the U.S. actions against Huawei uh, that uh, when they said they were going to do something against Huawei, what it meant... To, was saying that like there no federal funds would be spent to buy their routers. Um, they're they were not going to be using them in, in various government anything. And that's something that could be a ban that the federal government could easily do. Could say that like no federal employees on their government phones shall have TikTok. Um, though you know I don't know if that really would make a big difference to to TikTok's uh, uh, usage or or make them care. You could also have, uh, say, no no federal funds being spent on TikTok, which I guess could affect some advertising. Uh, so the you know, federal government would no longer advertise on, on TikTok. Uh, but could there be like a real ban, like a ban saying, you know, uh, one one form a ban might take is uh, no one can use TikTok again. U.S. citizens, I hereby order it. That that doesn't work. Like. Uh, there's no authority that gives the president the, the power to do so. If he nevertheless asserts that power, uh, it uh, raises serious constitutional issues. There, there's a uh, First Amendment issues that were raised when a medium of expression is being cut off by the government so that all the people who are using TikTok for their expressive activities, uh, you know, most of which are not having to do with national security. And that's the purported reason for uh, the ban, protecting national security. And if you're a teenager making a cool dance video, this may not implicate national security, even if uh, uh, the Chinese do know about that. Um, I should also say that you can simultaneously think that TikTok has bad security, bad privacy practices, and the government shouldn't have the power to ban it. Uh, and you know, sometimes people try and like conflate those, those two things. But remember, if the if, if president did have the power to, by fiat, say, I hereby ban this app, uh, they could do it with Signal. They can do it with uh, you know, a host of encrypted messaging apps that people rely upon uh, in order to have secure communication. Right? can't do that. Uh, there, there are other things that a ban may mean. I suspect that the the thing that's actually happening now is this this entity called the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States that looks at uh, acquisitions of U.S. companies for national security implications. Uh, ByteDance, the Chinese parent of TikTok, uh, purchased Musically, merged it to create the TikTok you you know and love today, or know and hate for that matter. Uh, and uh, they can say, you need to unwind that uh, investment. Uh, might be something that could happen. Um, that is not exactly a ban. But the weird thing that happened was yesterday, 
after things came out indicating perhaps they're going to be asked to divest, uh, the bite dance was going to be asked to divest TikTok, which probably meant just musically was an aspect of TikTok. Uh, then the president doubled down by saying, no, no, I'm banning it. Uh, and this was in response to reports that Microsoft was interested in purchasing TikTok. And, you know, yet again, he's like, he's saying something, but uh, it really is, should be on the government, you know, obligation of the government to explain what authority you have to do that. You know, what, what uh, uh, constitutional authority or statutory authority, but, you know, that, that doesn't happen, just says things. So we'll, we'll see if uh, a idle comment made on uh, uh, to reporters on Air Force One where, where that ends up having meaning. Uh, but if it attempted to be one of these broader bands, it would have severe constitutional issues. Absolutely. Our next question is, have you thought about organizing a federal citizen's grand jury as described by Justice Scalia? Um, yeah, let, let, me, let me answer that one, um, no. Uh, citizen grand juries is a performative thing that some people have done, like people have done this to indict Mueller if they didn't like uh, uh, what he was doing with the uh, investigation of Trump, they've used it uh, about uh, uh, 9-11. It is a, a method of you know activism of you know saying it's a citizen grand jury and, and saying you know you think these people should be indicted. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, you know, for anyone who's is going to be prosecuted, they need to in fact be indicted in the ordinary course of things. Uh, and that's not really our style of of uh, uh, legal work. Uh, one is that we are not prosecutors, right? We are on the defense side. We are the defenders of the internet, and we're. Um, trying to uh, uh, protect people. So we're not really gonna get into the prosecuting end of things. Uh, and the second is that, uh, you know, we would rather work through the uh, legal system, file lawsuits in the courts, try and create uh, precedents, at least for our legal. And then we have other things, other our activism things. All right, super. Uh, so next up, CFAA, can you discuss what you would consider to be the likely best case and worst case outcomes that might stem from the CFAA decision, as well as the aspects in which you think the court will be considering most critical to making their decision? Sure. Um, so the Van Buren case is actually fairly narrow in what the specific issue that it's presenting to the Supreme Court. Um, and it might be helpful to just describe the actual facts of the case briefly. So what the case is about is a police officer in Georgia who um, had access to a law enforcement database through, you know, as a normal part of his job and abused that access by uh, using the database to look up a woman who a friend of his, um, you know, told him that he was interested in. It turns out the friend was an FBI mole. So, uh, so the federal appeals court um, in his jurisdiction uh, that covers Georgia said that um, even though the cop was allowed to access that database for his job, um, he violated the CFAA because he, viol he accessed the database for an improper purpose, right? Um, and that decision was in direct conflict with a decision from a few years back out of New York with actually like eerily identical uh, facts that also involved um, a police officer with access to a law enforcement database for his job who accessed that database to look up women in a way that wasn't allowed. Um, and the facts diverge a little bit in ways I won't get into, but you can look up uh, Cannibal Cop to learn more about the facts of that case. Um, but, but the court there, the appeals court that covers New York said, um, that's not a CFAA violation because even though he used the, ac the database in a way that was improper, it was a database that he had access to, right? He's not breaking into this database in order to do it. Um, so two rules directly in conflict and, and that's really the question that's before the Supreme Court. And of course, it's not only about police officers. It's, it's, you know, we're hoping that it's, there will be a broader decision um, that will address terms of use violations generally, right? If I have access to um, my work computer or if you have access to Facebook, right? And we violate um, 
terms of use, then is that going to be a crime under the CFAA? So that's that's the answer that we're hoping to get from the Supreme Court. Um, and in a best case scenario, I think that the Supreme Court uh, would, you know, first of all, of course, agree with the majority of appeals courts that says terms of use violations are not a crime. And we'd love to see more sweeping language about, you know, the importance of computer security research and how that is impacted by the CFAA. Um, as well as some other problems with this aspect of the law, right? Like the fact that making violations of companies' use restrictions into a criminal offense really delegates the power to write criminal law to private companies, right? And that's something that should be happening through Congress, through your elected officials, right? Where citizens have a voice in saying what we want the law to actually be. Um, there are a lot of other problems with the CFAA and unanswered questions about how it applies that um, are very unlikely to be addressed by this case, right? And so that includes things like um, over-criminalization, right? There are uh, very, very high sentences that the CFAA imposes um, that can lead to even like, you, you know, say one computer security researcher uh, does one study in the public interest that involves violating use restrictions, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they can end up facing like possibly decades um, in federal prison for doing that under the CFAA right now. So, so sentencing reform is something we really want to see that's not actually going to be before the court in this case. Um, and then there's just a lot of questions about how it applies. Like, for example, um, if you share your password with someone and then they access uh, an account, is that authorized or unauthorized under the CFAA? Um, and that's probably going to take another Supreme Court case to answer. Okay, thank you, Naomi. So the next question, a lot of us freaks are doing party lines and VOIP calls and discussing OPSEC against lawless evil actors when it comes to call recording. If one caller is in a one party consent state like Philadelphia, but I assume it's Pennsylvania, um, and another is in a two party, uh, for example, New York, which law applies? I can speak to this also. Um you know, like every question posed to a lawyer, the answer is it depends and um, it's a little complicated and the law is actually going to vary on that question from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So as a general matter, uh, I would say that the best thing to do is comply with the most privacy protective law. Um, but the Reporters uh, Committee for Freedom of the Press also issues a guide called Can We Tape? Um, and that's a 50 state guide that actually does give state by state details. So it could be a helpful resource if you wanna look it up and figure out exactly what the rules are in your specific jurisdiction. Yeah, and I'll just add that the uh, Can We Tape guide also has a section which discuss some of the issues in more detail about interstate phone calls, uh, but you know it also concludes the same. Uh, Use the more restrictive one, the more private one. Thanks. So the next question is on HIPAA. Uh, any thoughts on HIPAA and privacy in our new paradigm of online medical care? I feel, this is the questioner, it's increasingly problematic, especially for those that have no alternative for their medical care. So I can only speak to that a little bit. Um, so HIPAA is a great law because it is a good example of what a federal privacy standard can look like when it's a floor and not a ceiling. So one of the cool things coming from a consumer data privacy standpoint, which is entirely different than medical privacy, um, it's the federal government has set a floor of there are certain things that are so sensitive and that are so unique to an individual that there has to be all kinds of explicit permissions between from the individual for that type of information to be shared beyond the initial point of contact. So when you go to your doctor and they do a scan of your insides, they are only allowed to share that information with very specific people for a very specific purpose. And each state actually has different ways that either HIPAA has been interpreted or different uh, protections on top of the federal standard. Um, and it's a great 
it's complicated. It's an incredibly complicated piece of legislation. Uh, there's another person at EFF who spent quite a lot of time looking at the intersection of HIPAA and some of the other consumer data privacy proposals that we have been working on. And all I know about it is because I've been in the same meetings with him. Um, and it's, it's a really, really complicated set. HIPAA is not completely ironclad. It's not like you only you and your doctor get to see it, but it's like you and your doctor and your insurance company can get to see it, but they can't advertise based on the information that is collected in the course of a legitimate proceeding. There are a lot of protections that are built into HIPAA, which is why you can't just text your doctor. You have to go into a portal that is secure. So you get encrypted messaging to go, or you can't just email them that you have to go into a special website that's extra layers of encryption to go over there. So there's a lot of hurdles that you have to jump through. And that's all because of HIPAA that's trying to keep you and your information private. Um, so it's an ongoing landscape. It's, I'm sorry, I don't have more on that. It's an incredibly complicated landscape and I don't want to go out beyond my skis. All right, thank you. So we, we next up, we have a, a short question here uh, about how to engage. So what is the best way to engage with elected officials who are far from us on the political spectrum? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a question I hear a lot um, since I'm working with organizers in all different parts of the country, all sorts of ends of the political spectrum. Um, but luckily for us, the EFF mission and the EFA principles are extremely popular. Um, and there are ways to address issues um, in a different way that will often be more appealing to folks. Um, people think about these issues in terms of narratives that they hear. Um, so something like face recognition, maybe for this audience is very clearly privacy invasive and um, limits our autonomy. Um, some folks see that as helping the police, that it's like a good thing because it helps them catch criminals. Um, so I think working on reframing that and saying, may, you know, we would say that's not the case, but it's also definitely a case of big invasive government um, getting involved in your life um, and um, altering your personal life. Uh, so kind of engaging on the individual level, uh, you can definitely reframe the discussion in a way that hits on again, these values that are ultimately very popular. Um, and in terms of elected officials, the nice thing about organizing is if you can't change their mind, you can work against them and block their efforts and maybe get someone else elected. Um, so yeah, definitely encourage organizing, building that support across the political spectrum on the ground. Um, and then the elected officials, hopefully you can press into doing the right thing. Yeah, so I mean, as the resident lobbyist, I lobby everybody on the political spectrum. You know, in the House of Representatives, there are 435 votes. And if you're going to win on a particular legislative measure, you need a majority. Um, in the Senate, there are 100 votes. And there are, you know, especially in our issues, there's an area where libertarians and civil liberties advocates, there is a Venn diagram of those people where they really come together. And, you know, as somebody was mentioning in the chat, and this is totally correct, focus on the thing that you agree on. So there are definitely members, I am not a single issue voter. For as much as I work at EFF, like there's a lot of other things that I care about in the world. And so I care about your position on this, and this is my day job. So I'm going to only talk to you about the things that are in EFF's portfolio and in the areas that I want you to focus on right now. So if we're talking about like FISA, Patriot Act stuff, uh, there is a lot of stuff that was coming up earlier this year that has to do with what programs are we going to reauthorize to allow the government and the NSA, the intelligence community to secretly listen to our messages. And there's a lot of distrust around that particular process. And some of the lawmakers that I work with who agree with the EFF position that we need to do a lot of reform I don't agree with them on literally anything else. And some of the things that I overhear when I'm sitting in their front office area as I'm waiting to meet with the staffer to talk about the Patriot Act, it's like, la, 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 la. I don't want, I don't want to hear, I don't want to have anything to do with that because this is what we're focusing on. They're on the committee that is going to vote on this legislation. If they're going to support our position, if they're going to support the legislation, that's what I'm here to talk about right now. 
can talk about all of the other stuff later in my personal capacity, but right now this is what we're focusing on because it's important. So you sort of pick the things that you want to focus on and then just drill down on that. Okay, so let's focus on uh, maybe another legislative question in, in a sense. Um, the questioner is asking, do you think there are any legitimate government uses for this technology? Uh, and they're talking about facial recognition and biometrics. But I think the, the, um, the questioner goes on to ask, uh, is the only path forward towards a full ban of facial recognition? No, that's a really great question. So we are currently advocating at the federal level, we are advocating for a full ban, full moratorium on facial recognition right now, because the short answer to the rest of your question is it depends. But what we know right now is there are so many abuses and potential abuses for the way this technology is being used right now that we need to put a full moratorium, a full ban on it right now, immediately, so that we can figure out if there actually are any circumstances where it would be appropriate, what are the correct safeguards and transparency requirements and oversight capabilities that need to be put in place later. But you can't do that while the technology is still on the street and still being used all over the place and people are worrying about which face mask to cover your nose all the way to the top so that you don't you know, get tripped up on the thing. It's important to put a ban on it now because that also supports a lot of the great work that the EFA groups have been doing and state and local governments. I mean, San Francisco's got a ban on uh, law enforcement use of facial recognition. There are other cities that do too. We really wanna make sure that we're supporting those local efforts. And we think the best way to do that right now is a ban on facial recognition. There's actually a bill in Congress right now, both in the House side and the Senate side from Senators Merkley and Markey and representatives Jayapal and Presley on the House side that would put this type of ban in place. We have an action alert on the EFF website if you want to contact your local representatives to tell them to support this legislation that is a ban right now. Um, and again, this is facial recognition, ban of facial recognition is something that we've been advocating for for a very long time. And once a lot of the protests started and people started realizing exactly what law enforcement can do with this type of power if it's not really curtailed or looked at critically, um, we started getting a lot of phone calls back from legislators. So we'd really like to see this legislation move forward. So anything that y'all can do to contact your local elected officials would be great. Super. And of course, we, we uh, su support EFF at HOPE. So just another plug for the uh, donations to EFF as part of HOPE and making sure we hit our goals there. I also just want to mention that we still have the Q&A chat uh, open in Matrix. Please post your questions there. Uh, and this panel will be continuing for uh, the, the rest of the hour up till 1.50 Eastern. So please do uh, throw questions into the, the Matrix chat there for the EFF panel. Um, the next question we have, are there any plans for the EFF to set up a presence on the Fediverse? So I'm not uh, aware of any uh, plans to, to do that. Uh, the Fediverse is, is a bit interesting because uh, it offers a variety, you know, federates a number of different uh, uh, networks, and so that may be handy. Uh, EFF, you know, we, we, we have uh, a number of online um, presences. Uh, it, it requires some resources to maintain additional presences, so we don't, like, jump into the next uh, uh, latest uh, thing. Uh, you know, sometimes we put a bunch of effort into something and then it became less uh, widely used. Uh, so we're a bit cautious on, on, you know, which ones to put that kind of uh, effort in. But uh, in, in some cases, we you know, maintain a presence uh, and uh, it seems to be worthwhile. So uh, as I say, I'm not aware of any plans to jump into the uh, Fediverse, but it's something that we, we may consider. Uh, okay. If Rory, you're on the activism team. Are you aware of any anything on the slides? Can you? Not at the moment. Um, I think it's a cool idea, but yeah, I think like Kurt said, um, we have to be strategic about how we use our resources, um, both in time in terms of hardware and in terms of hours. Our wonderful tech ops team has been working around the clock, having us all work from home. So um, yeah, I think it would be a cool idea, but no current plans. Yeah, but it is very interesting because it, it tries to solve, the Fediverse tries to solve a little bit of that by having a number of different protocols federated into one place, but uh, uh, 
it's we haven't gone there yet. Okay, thank you, Kurt and, and Rory. Um, so I think the next one is also asking a little bit about how you're you're, you're working and what you're interested in, in doing in a different way. Uh, has EFF thought at all about forming any state EFFs to focus on state legislation? So uh, uh, coming back through the mists of time, you know, we're now on the 30th anniversary uh, of EFF. And in the, the first decade in the 90s, EFF did have a chapter model. Uh, there were there were a couple of uh, state chapters. Uh, there also were some uh, international chapters, uh, and that that turned out to be sort of a, a unmanageable. Uh, we uh, abandoned that model, uh, though uh, those who had been chapters at the time were allowed to continue. We didn't want them to to cut them off. And there are a few that, that actually survive to this day. Electronic Frontiers Georgia uh, and Electronic Frontiers Austin in the United States, uh, Electronic Frontiers Finland uh, in the EU. And uh, I don't think they've done much recently, but Electronic Frontiers Italy uh, also has done some things in the, in, in the relatively recent uh, past. Uh, but uh, uh, so that, that and here's the thing, just talking about state legislation, uh, and, and maybe Roy can add a little bit to it, but the EFA. So the Electronic Frontiers Austin and Electronic Frontiers Georgia are part of our Electronic Frontiers Alliance. Uh, and uh, we, we have worked with them on state legislation uh, issues. Uh, there was one uh, with Electronic Frontiers Georgia where they were really uh, useful uh, and, and a powerful voice uh, for advocating on some bad uh, uh, security legislation being proposed in Georgia. Uh, and it made a big difference that it wasn't some, you know, San Franciscans coming to tell uh, Georgians what to do. It was people who lived in Georgia, who were like, you know, CS people from Georgia Tech who were in the community there going to their representatives and talking about it. Uh, and we've also, uh, uh, both those, uh, those chapters have had a strong presence at big conferences in there in the zone. So you have uh, Austin with uh, uh, the South by Southwest Conference. Uh, we've done some joint things with them there. The EF Georgia with the Dragon Con Conference, they run the Electronic Frontiers track uh, where we've gone to speak and, and talk a lot about uh, EFF issues. So it's great working with these organizations, but our model for doing that uh, today is the Electronic Frontier Alliance. And Rory, you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I just want to urge you to be the EFF you want to see in the world. Um, if you're interested in starting an EFF chapter, there's no reason you can't uh, start an organization and join the EFA, uh, work on state level issues. And as Kurt mentioned, we'll be happy to help you every step of the way. OK. This one, I'm assuming, is a follow up to the prior one on uh, on phone calls and and one party state, two party state, does a normal phone call have more legal protections against wiretapping? Normal versus a... Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering about that. I don't know if you interpret that. I, I interpret that as, as maybe versus the party line versus the voice of IP. Um, but if it's not meaningful, we can skip that one. Well, uh, just... I'll say a few things about this. So, I mean, yeah, a little unsure what, what normal means. It could be plain old telephone system call, I guess. Uh, you might call that a, a normal one. Um, and uh, there, there, has, there was some difference for a while under uh, CALEA, the Computer Assistant to Law Enforcement Act, uh, where internet was treated differently. Uh, they, they, Change the regulation a little bit uh, uh, to well, significantly, I should say, to uh, add voice over IP. For a long time, Kalia was hands off the internet completely, and he brought under uh, uh, voice under over IP under Kalia. Um, the uh, uh, other forms of communication, so might be treated, but separate from that, right? Other internet uh, communications might be separate from that. 
What that means is that whether or not the, the provider has various obligations to assist law enforcement is, is sort of the, the, the question. Uh, so maybe it's like treated differently in that way. Uh, but uh, uh, if, you, if you extend up to like the Electronic Communications uh, Privacy Act, that covers all sorts of, of communications. The Wiretap Act is designed about, you know, communications that go over a wire. Uh, so we would cover whether it's a normal phone call or a uh, abnormal phone call uh, would have all of the same protective uh, uh, armor, uh, and then you go finally up to you know things like you know your constitutional rights, and you know those are not uh, uh, technology dependent. So that's a little bit of more color on that. Yeah, but, and, uh, and actually, um, we we did just try and clarify what the question meant there. there. There was a bit of confusion there, but um, it's about mental health was the question I think originally. So it was was normal versus. Uh, a call discussing mental health issues, um, but I don't know if you want to add anything to that in that context. I mean, I think all communications deserve to have protections and privacy. Medical ones, I think a lot of people can see where that's from, but uh, all, all do. And if that question is is like related to HIPAA, uh, what I was talking about was protections vis-a-vis -vis like government law enforcement listening into your your conversations. And HIPAA is not about protecting you from law enforcement. Uh, so it's... Uh, okay, so the next question we have up is actually a follow-up on the facial recognition conversation. Um, should we also work, we've been talking about the uh, government uses, but should we also work to ban facial recognition technology in private spaces, like corporate badged environments? Yeah, so that one's a lot trickier. Um, so, the, it's easier to focus at the federal level because we have a lovely thing called the Fourth Amendment. And that is a great backstop to all of the things that we're trying to do to protect biometric information. And your face print is a pretty out there, easy to understand version of that. Once you start getting into the corporates, the relationship between employers and employees, that is an entirely different landscape of workers' rights and the contract between the employer and the employee. And there are a lot of things about various requirements that are concerning. And again, it really sort of depends on the specific of the individual information. There's a lot of people that are working on uh, workers' rights, specifically related to privacy and security and biometric safety. Um, and so that's, I'm not fully versed in all of that, but I know that it's very, very different. There could be other legitimate uses that they're using it for where it's not connected to the internet, it's not part of a database, it's not, you know, the way your phone, if you've got an iPhone, the way your phone recognizes either your face or your fingerprint is technically facial recognition, but it's not set up in such a way that it's ever going to be used or accessed by anybody at Apple, anybody, it's not in the iCloud, it can never be stolen. There's a different, there's a lot of different ways that that can work. So there are ways where it would probably be okay. And there's ways where it's deeply, deeply concerning. So it really depends on the specifics of what you're talking about. All right, super. Next question is also uh, coming back to the medical side of things and, and HIPAA a little bit. Why was there such a focus on protecting medical information very early on, but in every other aspect of life, our life was fair game for surveillance? Yeah, I can talk briefly about this um, and then maybe turn it over to my colleagues. But the first thing that I would say is that one of the biggest hurdles that we always face in getting people to care about privacy and surveillance is um, in getting people to think that it impacts them. Right. And there is a narrative that some people have that, you know, they have nothing to hide. Um, and so why, why not have mass surveillance uh, to improve safety? Right. And obviously, obvious to us, the idea that anyone has nothing to hide is just not true. So a lot of our advocacy and our litigation strategy around surveillance um, is, is working to reframe this for people. Right. So reframing it so people aren't thinking whether they have a criminal enterprise to hide, but do people value their own privacy, right? Do people have things that they don't want broadcast to 
every member of their family or their community or government or workplace. Um, and one of the examples that always has a really big impact on people is medical privacy. And so this is an example that we always bring up in litigation. We always talk about how, you know, just uh, to give an example, if you have location surveillance, uh, you know, um, automated license plate readers that track your car, for example, then, okay, maybe people think, I don't care if people know I'm going in my car. But when you point out that that means that your car is being tracked to the oncologist, right? Or to the Planned Parenthood or the AA meetings or, or whatever it is, whatever medical appointments you might have, people, people do care about that. And so I think this is just an area where people inherently really value their own privacy. Yeah, and to add to that, um, normally in my security trainings, what I try to tell people is, okay, you have nothing to hide, but what do you have to lose? So those are the things I usually discuss with people. The exercise that I always start with at these workshops is normally is, so if you lost your phone right now, what would happen? What does logistics look like be behind retaining your accounts? What would happen if you didn't have a pin code on your phone and someone could just unlock it? What happens and what people could look at? Are you comfortable with that? Do you feel okay about the state of your affairs? Personally, if you just lost your phone, let's say you left it on bus, or on BART or a train or anything of that nature, what will happen? And walking people through the exercise, you can kind of see like the, the freak out that happens. Like, man, if I lost my phone right now, like that'd be very devastating to my day and my week possibly. So that is what I usually um, go for when people are going the route of, I don't have anything to hide. I want to add, add one other uh, thing to that, which is that uh, uh, just kind of maybe a, a weird fact out there about uh, your your privacy. Uh, many people think, uh, or wonder, what is the most protected information about you? Uh, and it turns out the answer to that is what videos you watch. So the Video Privacy Protection Act is the strongest uh, uh, privacy protection that the federal government has has enacted. There's a lot of fears uh, to anyone looking at what videos uh, you're, you, you've been watching, and this came from uh, Supreme Court confirmation hearings, where uh, they were looking at uh, uh, confirming, uh, I think it was Bork, and uh, uh, some enterprise reporters found the uh, uh, video rental records uh, and uh, brought that in conversation. They were not actually particularly shocking video rental records, but then Congress simultaneously realized that what they had rented at the video store could be found out uh, and very quickly enacted an extremely strong privacy protection uh, for what videos you, you watch. And it talks about videotapes, but it defines it in such a way that it is still a relevant uh, uh, statute for, uh, for online. So there it is. Even more than your medical privacy, even more than uh, uh, your financial privacy, your social security number, it's what videos you watch that Congress has protected the most. Yeah, I mean, the thing with medical privacy is it's very easy for people that are not in this community to understand why it's important to have medical privacy. You know, they Congress passed and George W. Bush signed into law the Genetic Records Privacy Act because that was when gene sequencing first became a thing in the early 2000s. And like if you got tested and you found that you had the, the BRCA gene, the breast cancer gene, Congress really wanted to make sure that you couldn't be discriminated against either in hiring or for insurance prices or all sorts of other stuff. And so it was really, really easy for people to understand the connection between this personal private thing and also other potential negative consequences of that. So again, in our world, like we understand what all of the privacy means and it's sort of second nature. So at EFF, when the whole Cambridge Analytical, Analytica scandal broke, we were all a little confused because we, 
knew that this kind of thing had been a problem for a while. Like we understand why this is an issue, but all of a sudden there's this special secret sauce that everything happened at, you know, the same time. And the rest of the world understood exactly the type of information that all of these data brokers have about all of us and what that means for us and what they can do with that information. And it became terrifying to a lot of people who'd never thought about that before. So what that you know that I like Doritos? Oh, you know that I like this type of Dorito, and that means I'm more likely to vote for this type of political candidate. So you're going to advertise and send me this type. Like that's terrifying. And that's when we started talking about a bunch of consumer data privacy laws in the United States, which is great. There, we're still kind of a long way from getting a solid piece of legislation in that to protect regular data the way that we protect med medical data, but we're in a good place in the conversation and we're continuing with that. So, you know, keep up the good work, folks. All right, super. So the next question we have is, as a society, we put a lot of trust into the idea that the staff at the private companies holding our data are not abusing their access. For example, we trust that Gmail does not read emails anti-competitively to outbid competitors when hiring candidates. This trust is sometimes attacked as we saw in the recent Twitter hack that made use of insiders and of internal tools. What legal safeguards are in place and are there efforts to strengthen these legal safeguards? Nice short question for you. All right. Well, I mean, it raises a very uh, important point, as I say, like the the the, the insider threat, uh, and this was very uh, strongly illustrated by uh, by the recent uh, Twitter hack where they got onto the account management tool. Uh, but we've also seen, you know, years before there have been other uh, instances in which the uh, the means of attack to get onto a system was either uh, uh, a an issue with the uh, an insider going rogue or an insider innocently being compromised but with a someone escalated to that that insider's privileges and was able to to do things um and it absolutely makes sense to for for uh for companies who uh have uh, this kind of position to look at things to have all sorts of uh, uh protections against that kind of internal access. So they may need that access, uh, but there may be, makes sense to have a say for certain things, two people have to approve uh, the, the access. If it is like in Twitter's case, if you know someone is going to change the email address of a blue check account with a million followers, maybe multiple people need to sign off that that is a real request, do these kinds of things. Um, but uh, uh, for, for the large part, as far as legal protections that are involved in this, it has a lot to do with unfair trade practices. That is to say, if they have made promises to you about security and didn't live up to them, then uh, they can be held accountable for making those false promises. However, if you ran a website and said, it's, you know, it's the YOLO site and we have no security whatsoever, then you wouldn't have to worry about the uh, the false uh, uh, promises issue, though you'd have a really terribly insecure uh, uh, site. And actually, uh, Twitter and and uh, is under a consent decree with the FTC about their security practices from a run-in that happened uh, many years ago. Uh, one aspect of it was that there was like a pseudo uh, password, and I believe it was uh, Chuck Norris was the password for. Or pseudo, because uh, you know they thought that was funny, but it turned out that that was uh, uh, ended up being a big problem for them and led to a 20-year uh, consent decree with the FTC. Anything else to add on that one? Duck, duck, I'm not hearing you. I don't know if anybody else is. Oh, my apologies. Uh, the, the, the wonders of trying to keep background noise down. Um, so what is EFF's position on electronic voting where actually seeing your vote counted is impossible? Yeah, EFF absolutely opposes electronic voting where that's happening without a paper record. Um, 
And it's such a good question because this is such an important thing for everybody to be talking about and thinking about right now. Um, you know, look, electron, I don't think it'll surprise anyone in this audience to say that electronic machines are subject to breach and malfunction. And that's not just a hypothetical, right? This happens all the time. Uh, we see independent researchers who do pen testing into electronic voting systems uh, are able to breach those systems to do it extremely quickly to delete people's votes or change people's votes. Um, and these breaches are not even always detectable, right? You don't even know when they're happening, which makes it so important to have paper records so that you can detect these kinds of breaches and correct for them. And not only protect the integrity of people's votes and of the election results, but, but also to protect the appearance of integrity in the election, right? Because almost of equal importance is for people to believe that the results are, are reliable. Um, and so having paper records is just absolutely critical for that. We want paper records and we want regular risk limiting audits to go through and make sure that everything is showing up appropriately. Um, and of course, these are really important things right now. Everybody should be registered to vote. Everybody go vote. This is incredibly important now and always, but start now. All right. Our next question uh, is, uh, I think, about continuity of government and, and particular criteria in, in our U.S. Uh, federal system. Uh, I'm just going to read it out as it's written here. Are there different majority definitions for the House of Representatives and the Senate, such as if the Senate has 100 seats and 10 senators have died of COVID? Are 51 votes still required? Getting 51 out of 90 could be more difficult than getting 51 out of 100. If terrorists bomb Congress, like in Designated Survivor, and less than 30 senators survive, hopefully fewer, uh, a majority would not be possible. Does anyone want to comment on that? So that is a great, if slightly terrifying, procedure question. <laughs> um, so the way the rules are written is it is a majority. And so you look at so there's a process after the election where the members get seated. So, you know, after their states and districts, like states control a lot of election infrastructure, so they get sent to Congress, and then Congress seats them. There's a process on either January, on January the 3rd, usually, depending, if, unless it's a Sunday, where there is, they all get sworn in, and then they're officially seated in Congress. So that's what takes the total number of Congress on that day. So at the beginning of this Congress, for example, there was an election dispute in North Carolina. I think it was North Carolina that took a couple of weeks to resolve. So that district wasn't seated for a couple of months. So there weren't 435 members of Congress, there were 434 members of Congress. And so the majority is based on the number of members who are seated. So there is also times if members die, um, there's a process to remove, they're no longer seated because they're dead. Um, also members can take leaves, official leaves of absence. Um, there have been times when members have uh, taken maternity leave. Um, since you can't do, uh, you can't vote in Washington if you're actively having a baby. Um, they've taken official medical leave for cancer diagnosis and treatment, things like that. Um, so there is a difference between just missing votes and not being around, because then you still have to get 51 votes. So like when John McCain was nearing the end of his life, he was still an official seated member of the Senate. And so he still counted towards the overall total. So he could come in famously and, you know, thumbs down the vote. So protected the um, Affordable Care Act. Um, as it currently stood while he was undergoing cancer treatment uh, because he was still a seated member of the Senate. Had he taken official leave from the Senate, then the total number of seated senators would be slightly less. So in the event of a designated survivor situation where you only have 30 members of Congress, it's defined as majority and two thirds, not a static number. So we tend to conflate those two things a lot, but they're not the same. And the rules are written very clearly to be majority and two thirds, uh, depending on what you're talking about. So it's set up to be in that particular type of situation. But there's, there is a process that members have to go through to be seated or to temporarily not be seated. And it does change the margins. All right. Well, thank you for, uh, for handling that, India. 
Uh, our next question is a slightly shorter one. We have a question about COVID and COVID tracking. Uh, what is EFF's position on the mobile apps and, and the COVID tracking of um, you know, these things on iOS and Android? Well, so we, we talked about this uh, a bit uh, at the very beginning of this uh, show, but uh, for those who have joined uh, uh, since then, uh, in, in, in my introduction, uh, I was talking about some of the work we've been doing on uh, contact uh, tracing apps in particular, where we're uh, focused more on the proximity tracing, um, that uh, uh, the location-based apps are too much of a infringement on uh, uh, personal um, personal privacy and are not necessary. Um, and uh, uh, we put out a, a series of, uh, of, of principles that we would like to see. Uh, we want to have it be voluntary, uh, opt-in. There should be regular security audits. You should be able to uh, uh, s s turn it off and on at your uh, your your uh, at your whim, uh, and there has to be an expiration date. And uh, we, you mentioned sort of the iOS and Android, um, and so uh, there's probably a reference to the Bluetooth uh, program that have been put out by Apple and Google. Uh, that is a protocol, so the apps will be on top of that um, protocol. Uh, and uh, we haven't seen uh, one that got very uh, widespread here in the in the U.S. There are a number of apps out there, but they haven't coalesced against one app to be uh, uh, widely used. But that probably will be the more likely one because to have it really work to uh, use Bluetooth to determine proximity, it needs to be on in the background all the time and you have to use this API in order to have Bluetooth to be on in the background all the time. So people will probably tend towards those things. Uh, but to really sort of judge whether it sort of meets these standards of security, privacy, civil liberties, protections, is the complete picture that is necessary. So not just the protocol, which we know about, but a deeper dive on the app itself being put forth by the public health authorities. Okay, next up on data brokers. Do any in particular stand out as a greater threat? And how do we defend ourselves from data brokers? Uh, sure, uh, so on, on data brokers, yeah, I mean, data brokers uh, are a way that your information will be stored and sold to the highest bidder. Uh, and this makes it very easy for people to uh, find out about you. Uh, sometimes data brokers will, will actually package information to be sold to, to consumers, marketing it as like background checks. Uh, more often data brokers are selling it to entities like corporations or, or governments. Uh, and so the, you know, the, the best way to protect yourself from a data broker is to not have your information go into the data broker. So uh, you might check out things like the uh, Privacy Badger, a extension that you can put on uh, your, your browser to uh, make uh, uh, resist tracking cookies. Uh, but the truth is, it's hard. It's hard to not have your information ever get into a data broker. Like if you are perfect about this, you're, you're you know, all, all your life, and then one day you, you click the wrong box of saying, oh, I, I agree. Then that information is out there, and that broker sells it to another broker, it does it to another broker. So it's very hard. Uh, you can go to a number of data broker websites and say, I'm opting out. Um, some make that easy, some make that difficult, some use dark patterns. Uh, it's a process you could do, but that is, you know, uh, uh, you are blowing against the, the wind. Uh, it, it may help, but it's not going to get you all the way, uh, all the way there. Uh, and then another thing, legislation. Uh, so uh, in, in Europe, there is the uh, uh, GDPR, uh, in, in uh, California, uh, there's the uh, CCPA. So there are some, some statutes uh, uh, being contemplated or, or enacted that are trying to give people some of these rights to revoke their consent. And if someone revokes their consent, then something that was previously done through consent uh, has to stop doing it. Uh, so data brokers, you know, they, they uh, at least the least shady end of the data broker spectrum 
theoretically will respect your your consent uh and you know uh if you are if they're required to under these laws may remove your information upon request again gdpr also does that uh it protects people who are in the uh, european economic area uh basically europe but uh, uh it does not protect people in the united states nevertheless many people uh, uh use it from the united states because companies will say well we just it's easier for us to apply it generally i don't know if data brokers are going to be that um friendly about it so I'd also like to add that one of the things that we are really, really strongly advocating for in any federal uh, consumer data privacy legislation is something called a private right of action, which means that if you have, if the data broker has violated any of the statutes that get passed, any of the ways that your information is supposed to be protected, if we have a private right of action, that means you as an individual or EFF on behalf of a class action of its members, et cetera, um, is able to sue the data broker because they have violated the law as opposed to waiting for the attorney general or the DOJ to build a case. Um, there's a lot more enforcement mechanisms that are just sort of built into a private right of action system. Um, we see this in Illinois in particular. Um, so they have a biometric identity privacy act, BIPA, which we really like that has a very robust private right of action. And um, there's currently a lawsuit, um, ACLU is one of the lead um, litigants against um, Facebook uh, for violating the BIPA law. Um, I believe EFF is one of the uh, amici in the case, uh, but that's the type of thing that you see with a private right of action is it allows individuals to step forward and say, you violated this and this is not okay, you need to stop. And it happened almost immediately. And that's a really, really great way to make sure that the law is doing what it's supposed to be doing to protect your information. Private right of action. Okay. So our next question is about two factor. And I think we all understand that uh, corporations ask for phone numbers, not just so they can send you a text message, but for other reasons. Um, but the questioner is asking around the trade-off there of convenience versus privacy. He agrees having 2FA is more safe than not having 2FA, but at the same time feels like it's being used to force uh, giving up more private contact information. What thoughts do you have on those trade-offs? I can answer that. So with um, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, uh, one of the biggest problems is hasn't been rolled out in a way that's been uniform account to account. So something like giving over SMS information has been considered the worst practice of 2FA so far because of all the vulnerabilities with SMS, not just with corporations themselves using the phone number, but also the vulnerabilities of like signaling system seven, which, you know, dominates the SMS infrastructure. So that's something that I generally don't tell people to go for at first for SMS. And then there's, um, I would like more accounts out there, more services that offer 2FA to have multiple ways of being able to recover your account, because it sort of addresses the whole single point of failure aspect where if something happened to your phone, and all your 2FA tokens were on your phone, then you're kind of like, you know, left out in the wind and you have to, it's very difficult to retain access to your accounts unless you set up some sort of other way or secondary email to recover, right? So I'll just go ahead and say like, I don't, I don't think it's like an official EFF standpoint, but this is how I approach 2FA normally in that multi-factor. If an account offers different ways of actually being able to factor things in, I use things like YubiKeys, which are on my person. Um, yes, you can lose these too. Like these are the that's the trade-off. Like I could possibly lose a YubiKey. My toddler can go run off and hide it like she did uh, a couple weeks ago and I had to search for it in the couch. Or um, a way of storing your recovery codes in another place, um, possibly on your desktop somewhere and have it encrypted there. Um, also being able to use different tokens, like one-time tokens where you can have that on your phone where if you do lose your phone, you could at least have your UV key, or I could at least have my recovery codes that are stored somewhere else. Um, does that expand the breadth of attack where I have multiple things in multiple places? Yes, but you, if you store it in a way that makes sense for you and your model, 
I usually enforce that and suggest that. So 2FA and has been an issue because a lot of my friends outside my technical network are really annoyed by 2FA, especially my academic friends. Um, they really hate that the universities use things like Duo and enforce people to use 2FA just to access their email, et cetera. So it's not something that, um, that feels convenient at the moment because there hasn't been a rollout that's been uniform account to account and it hasn't been well discussed and, and been informing users on why this is good or bad. Right now, I'm seeing something called credential stuffing, as I mean, some of you may be already heard of, where credential stuffing has been one of the most uh, useful ways of accessing other accounts and escalating your privilege with other people's accounts. If you simply have the, you know, the plain text password access from some database somewhere that got leaked from some, you know, paste bin somewhere and you have their email, you can try it against other accounts and 2FA helps protect against credential stuffing in that way. And so that's why I am really, really um, behind 2FA in that way, but I do understand it can feel inconvenient at first. And if you don't store it in a way that makes sense for you, especially if you're new to it and you just do SMS or, you know, one-time tokens on your phone and you lose your phone, then it can be a huge amount of um, hassle to get back your account. But that's the way I usually teach 2FA and MFA and how to like parse that out in a way that makes sense for you. Um, maybe not do it for all of your accounts, maybe your most important accounts that you feel. So maybe not everything at once. So I try to roll out for somebody that where they feel like, you know, it's just being enforced on them and they're not able to access anything because they lost their phone and they're scared about those two factor tokens, which is not the general um, position behind 2FA, but that's where it's kind of led us to. So we have to, we have to reckon with that as a security community. Okay, thank you, Alexis. Uh, so our next question, the internet archive is being sued by book publishers. Does the EFF have a position on that case? Will you be helping them at all? Absolutely, we are helping them. We are representing them along with our good friends at a law firm called Dury Tongri. And just as background here, um, what's happening in this case is that the Internet Archive is a nonprofit organization um, that functions as a digital library, right? So it provides electronic access to all kinds of information that they have. Um, and they have a book lending program, just like uh, almost all libraries uh, right now that allows people to check out um, digital copies of books, right? And their program, just like almost all libraries, it lets people check out books for two weeks or less. It only lets readers check out as many copies of the book as the Internet Archive actually owns um, or its partner libraries actually own. And so, you know, if the archive and its partner libraries only have three copies, of a book physically, then only three patrons can read that book um, in its e-format at a time. So this is how all libraries pretty much um, are dealing with e-books right now. And we are very proud to be uh, working with Dury Tongri to defend the Internet Archive from publishers' copyright lawsuits um, and really all libraries right now. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, we are we're coming closer to the end, so I'm going to ask you to keep the remaining responses brief. Uh, I think we can probably fit two questions in. The next question, what global alliances or privacy organizations does EFF work with? What is the biggest global privacy issue? Can GDPR be created and work in the US for government and corporate oversight by customers? So we work with a, a lot of organizations uh, around the world. Uh, we are members of uh, EDRI, for example. EDRI is European Digital Rights, uh, which is an umbrella group of lots of organizations throughout the European Union. Uh, and uh, as well, uh, we work with like Privacy International in the UK. Uh, we have also a, a network of organizations we work with uh, throughout the rest of the world. Uh, I've done a lot of work uh, in Latin America uh, with uh, local NGOs who are uh, uh, doing a what we call a who has your back uh, project uh, who has your back is something done at EFF where we examine the practices of 
uh, various online service providers about how well they protect your data uh, against government uh, uh, intrusions, uh, government data requests. Uh, the local NGOs we work with customize that for their particular uh, legal and political situation and do reports about things in their country. So um, we're, we're absolutely working with, with uh, lots of uh, uh, global organizations. Uh, so we are running out of time, so I'll keep this kind of short just to one other thing on, on the GDPR. Um, think just taking the GDPR wholesale and bringing it to the United States, not a good idea. There are things about the GDPR that perhaps we've learned some lessons of how it was implemented that could be improved. There are things which are specific to a European experience. Also worldwide, uh, for a lot of countries out there, there's other data protection laws that those countries have, and not everybody is keen in having Europe be the uh, decider of what the best uh, data protection uh, policies are. Um, so it's an important thing, but uh, I wouldn't say just take the GDPR. Super. Well, thank you very much, Kurt, and, and thank you to all of our panelists from the EFF today. Um, the, we, we did have one other question we were going to get to, which frankly, I think the answer to is uh, a, a lot of what you've heard already, but go look at the EFF website to stay up to date with uh, news, to stay up to date with case law updates. Uh, and by all means to donate. And uh, please, if you haven't donated to EFF, uh, please look at the hope.net uh, website for our goals during this conference. And we wanna make sure we're keeping up with our, our expectations on the donations there. So again, thank you to the whole panel. And we are gonna be having a, a short break with our info beamer and with our bumps, hope.net slash bumps.html uh, before we start the next conversation at the top of the hour. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.